the court, which is the Museum of College I could be being sitting there waiting to see us, but um, yeah, you know, these, things, yeah, these great. things happen with our lives. Amazing. So, um, but before we talk about this Sunday, um, should we quickly just talk about um, where people can contact us? Yeah, so you can email the church at lifechurchhome.com if you have any questions about the church or if you just want to get in touch about life groups and other events that are going on in the church. You can also comment here in the chat. We have firing in the chat so she can answer. Yeah, so please put all your questions on, yeah. on the chat. We'll just let you know that we've got well, sorry, our college principal Matthew Harrison on this morning. We've got baby dedication. Yes. Oh, I love baby dedication. They're so good. So that's going to be amazing. And um, where we invite all of our um, young families, baby babies, to dedicate their little ones. So that's going to be so much Yeah, fun. it's such an important time for the church, especially when we do dedicate our um, babies and children. It's just such a wonderful yeah. um, Wednesday. So, um, but please, we will be back. Um, after the service, so uh, please put all your prayer requests, all your messages online, and uh, we shall see you after the service. Okay, see you later. Thank you. Bye. This morning, it's good to see you all here at church. If you're joining us for our dedication, you're, you are so welcome. We're going to worship together. I don't know about you, but I am excited to be in the house of God today. Come on, let's worship together. Let's do it. Who can say the word for creation? Who can form a body from the dust? Who can calm the waves of every ocean? There is only one, and he's my God. Who can turn our morning into dancing? Who can turn our sorrows into joy? Who can part a sea and save the nation? Because there is only He is faithful, and His power has no end. Oh God is ready, He is able. There is nothing my God can do. Hey! Who can use the boy to slay? the light of every life there is only one and he's my God there, there is only one and he's my God oh, God is mighty oh, he is faithful and in his power God is This morning, you ready to get your singing voices on? Here we go, let me tell you. For nothing is impossible, you sing. Oh, 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 my God, there's nothing you can do. For nothing is too hard for you, you say.
Let's sing God is mighty. Here we go. God is mighty. He is faithful. And his power has no way. For God is ready. He is able. There is nothing that my God can do. There is nothing that my God can do. Oh, hallelujah, worthy Jesus. Stop. 
morning to say that you are making a way for us. Even though we don't feel like it, even though we may not see it, Father, we believe it that you have gone ahead, that you are making a way, as your word says, in the wasteland. That, Father God, you are the same shepherd in the valley as you are in the peace and in the tranquil. And I would encourage this morning, we're going to sing a song called Speak Jesus. And the truth is this morning, I believe that if you want to see a change in your situation, you need to begin to speak the name of Jesus over it. There is power in the name of Jesus, not just singing songs and words, but some of you need to open up your mouth this morning and say, Jesus over my situation, Jesus over my family, Jesus over my finances, Jesus over my situation in the name of Jesus. We're going to sing it out. Here we go. Come on. Well, I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Come on.
top of the mountain with Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Oh, Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Oh, Jesus. Shout Jesus. Oh, shout Jesus from the mountains. Oh, Jesus in the streets. Oh, Jesus in the darkness.
Amen. It's so good to be reminded of the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we sing of our Father God and we know what Jesus did for us, but let's never neglect the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches us that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive in you. That's the Spirit of God that is in you. The Bible teaches us in Ephesians 3.20 that he is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask, hope, or imagine, but it doesn't stop there. According to what? According to his power at work in you. Say to the person next to you, I'm powerful. Say to the person on the other side, your second choice, say, I don't think you're hearing me. I'm powerful. Just, just consider this for a minute. This is what John 14 in the, in the Amplified, I wrote, I've just written this out. This is what, when Jesus says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. This is what he says in John 14. He says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit who is your helper. Does anybody need help today? He's your comforter. No matter what this world throws at us, we can look on the inside because Jesus, because what he's done for us means that we have access to God and Holy Spirit is on the inside of us as our comforter. We don't need to look for external stimulation to bring that peace and comfort. He's already on the inside. It says he's our advocate. It's not a word we use a lot, but it means somebody that stands on your behalf. Somebody that sticks up for you. Somebody that's on your side, that stands in your corner. It says he's our intercessor. Again, that's somebody that fights for you, that stands in that gap between where you think you are and where you need to be. And the Holy Spirit says, don't you worry, I'll stand in here for you. It says he's our counselor. He guides, he gives wisdom, shares his hope. And then it finally says he's our strengthener. Oh yeah, we received that today. So whatever we're facing, we're just going to pray together now as a, as a family church. Whatever it is that you're facing, I want you to get a fresh revelation that you have a part to play in those answers. Because His Spirit is at work in you. And some of you are asking God for things, but actually the work that God is going to do is actually a work inside of you. It's not actually changing the situation. It's something He's going to do inside of you this morning. So whatever it is that's on your heart, whether it be for for yourself or a family in the church or somebody outside the church that you know, let's, let's pray this morning. Just bring our prayers to him, knowing that he's all powerful, but he is at work in us this morning. Come on, let's pray. Thank you, God. God, we thank you for the powerful work of your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you are all we need, God, no matter what this world throws at us, that we have everything we need in you. God, we believe you can move mountains, we believe you can bring peace where there's absolute chaos, God, and we believe you are at work in our lives. So God, where we need you to move outside of us, God, we pray that we see you do it, that we would see breakthrough, that we would see healing, that we would see provision. But God, why are you calling us forward to move in us? Father God, open our eyes to see what you want to do in our lives, that we would see your power at work in our lives today, that we would see you bring the breakthrough through us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have made me powerful today. In the mighty name of Jesus, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. All right, go ahead and grab your seats. I'm going to invite Shirley up to join us. Come on up, babe. 
because we are about to have a cuteness overload. <laughs> Not because my wife's here. Uh, <laughs> you are very cute. Uh, no, because we're going to have child dedications now. Yes. Can we have a little bit more excitement when I say child dedications? And uh, just a special welcome, especially to all the, the families that are visiting with us. We hope you feel at home and feel really welcomed and just enjoy it today. Yeah, we're so excited that we get to do this together as a family. We get to unite, we get to pray over these beautiful lives, and we get to be part of that. And in a moment, Jock's going to call every family up, and together we're going to declare a blessing over them, and we're going to pray over them. Yeah. So before we have the lineup, just, uh, and we get to all go, ah, oh, at the cute, cute little ones, just a little explanation of, of what this is so we could, it's a child dedication. You won't see us um, sprinkling water or anything like that that maybe you're used to in a church service. And, but just let me explain what a, a dedication is. Really, it's, it's three things. It's first of all, it's a celebration. It's giving thanks to God for what he has done, for the miracle that these kids are. Some of these kids represent, to be honest, really long journeys of hoping and praying and believing. And, uh, and we just really... This is a time to celebrate, to be thankful. So you can whoop, you can cheer, you can make noises and things because we're going to celebrate what God has done. The second thing is it's about, um, it's really about a dependence on God because this isn't just a dedication of the children. It's actually also about the family that are bringing these children because those of us that are parents know, good Lord, we need help sometimes. <laughs> And it's not easy to be a parent, to, to guide our kids through the society that we live in today, to lead them in godly ways. And it's kind of a, a moment to say to God, God, we need your help. We need this church family help. We need to yeah. depend on you. We look to you as our strength. And therefore, the third thing, it's not just saying thank you to God, but it's dedicating these children back to God and saying, God, we put ourselves before you. These are your kids. This is your family, and we want to do things your way. So we're going to celebrate, we're going to pray, and we're going to get them up. As they, as they come up, um, we've also asked some of our families, uh, some couples in our church to stand with them and, and pray with them, and they've been actually praying for them this week as well over the week. So um, shall we start? I do the first one. <laughs> first up, we have the mighty... Jackson James Baxter with Aaron and Fee. Next we have baby Noemi Douglas, parents Andrea and Ivan coming up. Come on up, guys. Fantastic. Next up, we have Levi, Jasmine, Jane, Lee, daughter of Marcus and Pam from this side, I think. Here they come. Come on, bigger round of applause than that. Woo! Next, we have baby Taya Lucille Peterson daughter of Taryn and Devon. There we go. <laughs> Next up we have Nancy Mary Ellis and, and with Stephen and Tamara. Where are they? There they are. Beautiful. Next, you have baby Eleanor Lily Gadis, parents of Ruth and Luke. Oh, beautiful. Is it me? Yeah, I think okay, so. I'm, get, I'm just talking to the babies and things, sorry. Um, next up, Theodore on my tour show. It's Michael and Samira. Here they come. <laughs> Coming up. 
come on through, come on to this. And then last but yeah. not least, we have SEIO with Lanry and Tolu. So come on up, guys. They decided to sit right at the back just so they could do a, a big long walk so we could applaud them all the way. Brilliant. What an amazing crew. And just before we... Uh, woo. Before we, before we pray, we're just going to go along the line a little bit and see who we've got, just so you know who you're praying for. I think you know, uh, you'll know all these families, but just uh, we'll start with Aaron and Fee here, Baby Jackson. Hey, buddy, can I get a high five? No, yes, yes, no, not today, not today. Um, you, obviously, you've seen Aaron leading worship, but Fee's on staff with us here as well. She does a lot more behind the scenes stuff, but uh, an amazing family, we know it's been quite... It's been a, a, an awful year for you guys in, in, in ways, but this is a celebration day and we're excited to stand with you as a family today. So good, so good. Shell? Yes, we have baby Noemi here. Hi, guys. Hi. Parents, as you know, Andreas and Ivan, you've been here with us. for you're, you're part of the family, aren't you? You came here as college students, stayed through, and we're so delighted to be able to see your second baby here. Amazing. And can we wave? Because I think there's like a family from Portugal watching. Is that right? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Amazing, we've got Marcus and Pammy. Marcus, how long have you been in the church, brother? Oh, 30 years or something ridiculous. 30 years. That's amazing considering you're only 28. So brilliant. We're so delighted. Delighted for you. We know this has been quite a journey for you guys. And so we're delighted that we get to stand here and celebrate with you today. We've got baby Taya here. Parents, Taryn and Devon. It's actually, I don't know if you know him, but he is uh, known as the African warrior does the, the dark tournament and he's away at the moment, but we couldn't hold off any longer, could we? <laughs> and so here we are today being able to celebrate beautiful baby Taya. And uh, here we've got Stephen and Tamara with Nancy looking awesome. Thanks for getting up, Stephen. Hope this isn't freaking you out too much. So, uh, <laughs> but been part of the church for a little while here. And again, we're just so delighted to celebrate with you guys. Beautiful. Actually, all the way down here, we have baby Eleanor. Oh, the hiding. <laughs> And I love the baby Sophia as well. Well, you're not a baby anymore. You got dedicated before, right, Sophia? So now it's her turn. But it's beautiful to have you finally to be able to do this. And when we spoke this morning, it was the excitement of finally we are here and we can now do it. So we're so excited to be able to celebrate with you this morning. Yes, now, Michael, I need you to step forward a minute. Oh, yeah. Because this, this man deserves, wait, wait, wait. This man deserves more applause because Samira doesn't like to hang about. So she just decided, you know what, I'll just have it at home and you have to deliver it, Michael. So Michael delivered his own baby. Come on. We should applaud Samira more, though, shouldn't we, really? <laughs> Brilliant. And then I'm going to go all the way down this end. There's a lot of you today. I'm going to go all the way down this end. To this amazing family. Don't they look awesome? Don't they look best? Definitely win best dress prize. And this is Izzy Ayo, who's a little champion. And uh, Tolu, I'm just going to ask you just to share a few words just to encourage the church in, in your journey. Praise the Lord. Um, thank you, everyone, for being with us today and being with us over the past few months. Um, I'll just share a bit of our story and just give the glory to God because it all belongs to him. So we've been together as a couple for the past 16 years and we got married 11 years and some months ago. It's the glory of God in my teenage years, I got diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome and it's been a journey. I just want to thank the God of my journey, the only one who is and was and is to come. Our father, the great king, our promise keeper, the living one. I just want to adore his name this morning. I'll just share a bit of, um, a couple of you know us in the church. We've been in this church for the past 
eight years thereabout. And I just want to thank the pastoral team. Um, so in our journey, we we're trying to, you know, increase the family and in populate the health, subdue it, like the father told us. To. <laughs> in the course of that, we realized there was an impediment because of the police stupid race and all of that. I thank God for this awesome man of God, for his faithfulness and God's faithfulness in him. So we started the journey, the NHS, the tests, all of that. And God was with us. He stood by us. He was our strength, our guide, our helper. I'd like to read a verse of the Bible for us at this point. In case you don't know this God, please know him. In the words of God in Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Um, that's all I added now. Sorry, verse 32. He said, Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? When the Bible says everything else, it means everything else. So for him to have given us his son, he won't give us anything we need, we ask, or we so desire. So we ask God for a baby. Every time there was a prayer call, I would come out. My husband would come out. Sometimes I'll just feel like I wouldn't come. <laughs> On one of those days in 2019, I could remember specifically, there was a, an altar call for prayers. And I just felt like I don't want to go out anymore. It's been ages. And at that point, we had had two unsuccessful pregnancies. So I was sat right there. One of the ladies praying for us was Helen. I could remember vividly. She had a baby with her. I just looked at her and sat back. All of a sudden, she opened her eyes and looked at me across. And then she waved. She, she beckoned. And then she came to meet me and said, what is it? What do you need? And I said, I've been asking God for babies. Then I burst into tears. And she said, God will do it. I know he will. And then she prayed with me. And that was the we went. Some months later, after another cycle of IVF, we were pregnant. We were ecstatic. We were joyous. It was unbelievable. That was at the end of 2019. Then we had to move. We had to go temporarily to Scotland because had got to gotten a new job and we were in Glasgow. And then the lockdown hit and we came back home. On one of those days, I was at home. My husband was still working in Glasgow. I was 24 weeks gone. We had done this scan some days ago. Everything was moving well. We had just a couple of weeks more to welcome our baby. And then she came suddenly at 24 weeks. I'm very grateful for Pastor Jock and Pastor Shelley. They were with us, they stood by us. We had our baby, and then we lost her after two days. <laughs> it, was a, it was the dark night of the soul. So, in our journey, it was just one of those things. <laughs> At the funeral in May of 2020, Pastor Jock asked us to get some songs to sing. And one song that really spoke to me at that point in life, it was, there is another in the fire standing next to me. <laughs> he did stand by us. And when we sang Dance Again, he says, my tears will dry and I will dance again. You are welcome to my dance. <laughs> We're dancing again. <laughs> Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. So, Lou, thank you so much for sharing that. I know, I know you weren't going to originally. You were just going to talk about God's faithfulness. But thank you for sharing that. And I don't know who would encourage us here today, but thank you. And you know, Tulu, you told me that SEIO's name meant response of joy. And actually, you made me start thinking about what do all these names represented here mean? And so I had a little look at all the names here. And I'm no, I know parents, you probably know this already. But represented here, we have grace, God's gift, delight, divine, God's divineness, harmony, joy, 
These are all the names that were the meaning of the names of what the babies that were coming here today. And what I realized was that all these names were speaking of hope. All these names speak of a hope that we have in God. For some, it was hope deferred. For some, it was the hope of what we carried for nine months. For some, it's the hope of the now. For some, it's like the hope of the future and all that is to come. But I know that I know that I know that that their timing, when they were born at a time where the world has struggled, you know, with hope and joy, God's timing is perfect. And I so believe that they are born for such a time as this. And there's a reason that Jeremiah 29 says that I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. And what else? To give you a hope and a future. Because there is no better future than one that is attached to hope. So I am really believing that these babies today are carriers of that hope, that deep sense of confidence and security that my God is able to do all things. And I really pray that these babies are ones that will carry hope as a light in the darkness, that they will carry hope as carriers of his peace, that they will carry hope in the possibility of what is in the future, that they would carry hope, that they would embrace the unknown and just know that God is with them. And so that is my prayer for you all today, that you would know them as hope. And I just want to pray as we are going to, um, we're going to go into, we're going to go and pray. Okay. We're going to go and pray in a second. But parents, I just wanted to leave you with this verse from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're not alone. You have the Holy Spirit with you. And I so believe that this is an overflow of his hope and his joy for you. Amen. 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 Let's continue to pray. I'm going to invite Pastor Steve, who's back there somewhere. Let's all, let's all pray. Oh, my. Church is growing, everyone. You know, all these beautiful families and parents are going to need the support of all of us. Yeah. You know, I was thinking that as, as, as we were in the worship that when a tree grows, the strength of a tree is its roots. But one tree can fall over, can't it? But when the roots are intertwined in the community of the family of God, then together we can help parent. I want to be an adopted parent to many of you, all right? We need more babysitters. We need more grandparents. We need more youth pastors, kids workers, because we have to raise a generation. And so I want to invite you, if you're a friend or family, Maybe you've not done this before, but just stretch out your hand if you're comfortable. If not, we're just going to pray on our heart so that you can join your faith with mom and dad up here over these beautiful children. Jesus, we thank you that there are no accidents of birth. Only your divine design. And each one of these handcrafted, tailor-made, precious children we give to you, oh God. We dedicate them to you. And as we do that, Lord Jesus, we would ask, according to your word, that you would send angels to watch over them. Angels from heaven, but also angels in this community. Angels in this house to be moms and dads and extra aunts and uncles and grandparents to help these children grow up to become mighty oak trees in your presence, oh God. Let hope manifest, joy manifest, faith manifest, and all the other elements you have destined these children to become. Let them grow in your house strong, Lord Jesus. And when mom and dad or parents struggle at times with sleepless nights or with questions that we don't know the answers to, oh God, we thank you that you know the future before it was ever written for these amazing children. And so we dedicate them into your precious hands, God. And we are fully expectant for incredible things to come from the life of every single child. Amen. Amen. Can you welcome these children into our church family this morning? Come on, give them your best shout because this really is incredible. Fantastic. Okay, moms and dads, you can just take your kids off now. So good. So good. Ah, oh, brilliant. Wasn't that great? So good to do as a family of God. And as Steve said, we've all got a responsibility now. It takes a village to raise a child, they say. Well, turn the person next to you. Give them a quick smile. There you go. 
we're going we're gonna to press on into the Word now. And uh, for those of you that don't know, we've been doing a series called Seek First, and we're going to carry that series on. It's really about how we, how we take steps to discover God's best, and we've been doing that since the start of the year. And we're now going to uh, get into the Word and invite the amazing Matt Harrison, who is our Bible College principal, up to share the Word. So come on, let's give him a big welcome. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, what an amazing moment that is, and uh, it's always such a blessing to be able to be part of, thank you, Noah, to be able to be part of these moments where we can pray over not just the future of the church, but the church of today. You know, these kids, we're not waiting for them to grow into something. We are raising them together, and uh, it's always such an honor that we get to be a part of that, the family of God at work. Now, as Jock said, um, we are in our series, Seek First, and we've been looking at some amazing uh, principles of what it actually means as a church family together, as a Christian today in this modern world that we live in with all the things that are going on and all the chaos around us. What does it actually mean to be seeking God? What does it mean when we put Him first, and how can we practically go about doing that? So if you were here last week, you'll know that we spoke about fasting, and uh, Shirley James did an amazing message on fasting on that, and we fasted as a church on Wednesday. Now, if you did not fast, please don't feel like I've got to sink into the ground and hide away from everybody. Um, I learned to fast. I practiced fasting on that Wednesday. I didn't learn it, but I practiced it because I hadn't done it in a while. And I found the best way for me to fast is between meals and snacks. I thought to myself, that's a great way to fast. Between my morning meal, my, my morning snack, then lunch. I'm just joking. That's, you go back and listen to what Shirley said, proper theology on that. But uh, today, we're going to be talking about community. And uh, to start us off, I want to share you a little story. Um, and the story comes from a question that I want in your mind as we are working through this, this subject and the time that we have. Have you ever found yourself in a place, either physically or uh, relationally, maybe you might feel a little bit like this this morning, uh, sometimes we can, where you look around you and you go, how did I end up here? How did I end up in this place? How did I end up in this position? Now, when I was young, growing up, many, many years ago, um, my family, we, we were very blessed that we had family friends who had a house in a game reserve. I grew up in a part of the world where there's all kinds of places you can go to be in nature and be with animals. And uh, we would go frequently in school holidays, whole big groups of us, different families, to this particular house in a game reserve called Kubieni. Now, Kubieni is a place that is renowned for their rhinos, all right? They had these incredible population of rhinos. Not a lot of them, but the ones that they had were pretty spectacular. There was one particular female rhino whose name was Longhorn. That was her name, right? And you can probably guess why she had that name. She had a very long horn. Rhinos have these horns. And then there was a male rhino whose name was Big Daddy. And uh, Big Daddy was called Big Daddy because he was the Big Daddy. And uh, Longhorn and Big Daddy, in one particular year, kind of got together and nature did its thing. And uh, Longhorn had this calf, and the calf actually grew up to be this, uh, another spectacular, he had a, a, a horn that outgrew Longhorn's horn. And this is going back many, many years. But we arrived on the scene at this place on holiday, a whole bunch of uh, my mates and I and our families, when Longhorn had just given birth to this calf. And uh, we decided one day it would be a good idea to walk from the house to the clubhouse in the middle of the reserve. And it was just a place where you could go and you could play pool and snooker and you could just hang out, nothing fancy. And in order to get there, you had to go along this dirt road. And the road would run and it, at certain points, it would branch off into two different directions and it would form a loop before it got back to one road on the other side. And in the middle of this loop, there was this long grass. Now, to an adult, it probably came up to about here, but when you're about eight or nine years old and you're that big, you can't actually see what's in the grass. And we were walking, a bunch of us kids, and uh, my friend, whose, whose place it was, his dad, Gary, was with us, and he said that he could see a rhino in the long grass. And so he said to his son, Trav, he said, why don't we see if we can get close enough to find out if this is longhorn and a calf. And they thought this was a great idea. We all kind of stood there looking at the grass, not able to see anything, and they crouched down and they moved into the long grass, kind of like that Jurassic Park movie where they go running into the long grass. 
And all of us waited and waited and waited. And I just assumed a position like that, ready to go. Now, if you've never been near a rhino, there's one single most important rule is if it decides to come towards you, you find the tallest tree and you go up that tree. And no matter how close you are with the people that you are with, it is every man for himself <laughs> in that moment, okay? So they go in and there's just dead silence. You can just hear the birds going and there's absolutely no movement, nothing, for about, felt like an eternity. It was probably about three minutes. And we're watching, we're waiting, everybody's holding their breath. And then we hear this, ch -ch 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 -ch. and my friend Trav, who was my age, comes running out of the grass like this, and he just goes, Longhorns behind me! And I just bolted. It was like, it was like those movies where the little cartoon legs go, and there's just dust. One of my friends ran so fast, I did not see him, and he was waiting for us at the clubhouse for about 15 minutes by the time we got there. Now, I ran off, left everybody else, didn't even look behind me, and there was no rhino, right? It was his idea of a little joke. What they thought they had seen, they had not seen. And in that moment, I remember thinking to myself, probably not as eloquently as this, but I remember thinking to myself, how did I get in this position? How did I get here to a point where I've now got, in my mind, this two-ton, angry boulder running after me? How did I get here? And at different points in my life, that has been the question. How did I get here? Just the other day, Bernadine and I were out somewhere, and I walked outside, and I looked up, and I said, I'm in England. How did I get here? How, how did this happen, right? But there's one place that I am constantly amazed when I look around me and I see, I see what God has done. And that is in the place called the church. And I look around and I say, how did I get here? Not in this particular church, not in this specific, but in the church, the people of God. How did I get here? And I would say to you that perhaps we need to rephrase that question if you've ever asked it. Instead of how did I get here, we can ask, why am I here? Why am I here? I think for all of us, we're trying to understand, we're trying to work out, okay, if I am a Christian, and that is what I believe, and that's how I see myself, why then am I a part of this body of people? What does community actually mean for me? And if I'm not a Christian, and I'm here because of you know, whatever reason, and I'm watching online, what does this thing called church, what does this community actually mean for me? Why does it exist? Now to understand that, we need to look at a biblical vision of community, right? We need to go to scripture, we need to see what God has to say about it, what he's revealed to us about community. And our starting point is gonna be looking at the kind of community, our understanding today, okay? We're all shaped by the world that we live in, and we have a very specific understanding of community. I call them two different types of community. Individualism, they'll be up on the screen, and collectivism. Individualism and collectivism. And we're gonna just go through this real quick. We don't have time to unpack it all, but it's gonna be important for us to understand what scripture says. Individualism marks most Western culture today, and it has for the last 100, 200 years. It is the sense that in this thing called life, the individual is the most important person, all right? Everything that I do, I do for me. And individualism promotes what are called personal liberty or freedom, political liberty and economic liberty, all from the point of view of the individual. Now we see that when we work out life, when I'm trying to make a decision about my life, what do I think? I think, how will this benefit me? What's in this for me? When I get married, right? I did not, you know, just kind of go walk around and say the first lady that I saw and say, would you like to marry me? I went through a process of dating, my now wife, and we kind of figured out, is this, are we good for each other? Is this gonna benefit me? And a lot of times our relationships are focused on us. The world is focused on us. That comes from a culture called individualism. We see this in church and sometimes I'm tempted to take the scriptures and read the scriptures for me, everything. Now there are certainly parts of the scriptures that speak directly to me, right? Jesus died for me. Jesus saved me, his grace is for me, but there are aspects of the scriptures that talk about so much more than just me. 
But that's the culture that we're in, right? And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it. It is a reality, and we're not going to march out of the doors and change it, but we need to understand that the culture has shaped us to view the world this way. The second one is collectivism. It's more common in Eastern cultures, and its focus is on community interdependence. The, the kind of line of thinking that as you go, so I go. Now, and, and where I'm from, um, originally this is the overwhelming kind of view of life, all right? As you go, so I go. Everything that happens at a community level impacts the individual, so individuals think in terms of community. Uh, it's very common in collectivist cultures to think, how will my marriage impact not just me, but my family? Not just, will, the, will my family like this person, but what, what, how is this going to change the dynamic? How is this going to be of help to my family? How will my education impact my family? How will my, my uh, employment impact my family? There's a guy named Joseph Hellerman, a pastor in America, who wrote a book, When Church Was a Family, and he looks at the first century when all of this was written, right, way, way, long before our time, and he looks at the context that the biblical authors lived in, and he identifies these two points. They lived not in the culture that we know and understand and operate in, they lived in a culture that he calls strong group culture. So when we're reading scripture and we're asking questions about community, we need to understand that the Bible is speaking from a point of view of what will benefit the group, not just the individual, right? You with me so far? Everybody turn to the person next to you and say, I'm in. I got it, right. So to understand this biblical view of community, we gotta understand the cultural view. And we can go into this for the next hour and a half. I don't know if you gotta be anywhere, but... Um, I'm kidding. No, we're not going to do that. But I just want this thought in your head. In the strong group view, the most important relationship is the relationship of those whom you share blood with. Parents, brothers, sisters. Okay? Today, my most important relationship is to the person I'm married to. Right? And I can find scriptures that support that, and there is nothing in and of itself wrong with that. But in the, in the time of the authors of, of Scripture, of our Bibles, your allegiance was to your family. And that were, those were the people who came first in every decision. Now, that's slightly different to how we think about family today, right? So, we've got to take all of that context, and what I'm going to do in the time that we have, I'm going to give you three points with that context in mind that's going to help us understand how the Bible frames community. All right, you up for the journey? Yeah. Amazing. All right, let's go. Here are my three points. If you're taking notes, you can write these down, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on each one. The first point is this, Ubuntu theology. Ubuntu theology. The second point is this, community is reconciliation. Community is reconciliation. And the third point is reconciliation produces responsibility. All right, reconciliation produces responsibility. So first point, Ubuntu theology. So in South Africa, where I'm from, strong group culture is called Ubuntu, okay? Now, if you work in the software world, you might have come across Ubuntu softwares or something like that. It's not that. It is a, a collective kind of understanding as to how we treat one another. Throughout Africa, it is called something different, but the most basic definition I can give you is that I am because we are, right? I am because we are. Not I am because I choose to be. I am because we are. And Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who, who recently um, passed away but had a tremendous impact on, on really the world, proposed what he called an Ubuntu theology. He based it on Genesis chapter 126, where the scripture says that God creating mankind, human beings, said, let us make man in our image. And the archer's kind of thinking was, if we are all created in the image of God, we share an equality before God. God accepts and loves us each the same. And he asked the question, if God loves us like that, what does that mean in how we relate to one another? How should I treat you, my neighbor, my friend, my family, if I understand the common identity that we share? 
He also considered Paul, who wrote in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. This idea that how the world categorizes us does not influence the family of God. So that's Ubuntu theology, that we will overlook earthly distinctions and we will see each other as God sees us. Now the consequence of this is that my success and position in this life is directly correlated to your success and position in life. I do not get successful, whatever we mean by that, because I put myself first. I get successful when I come alongside you and we build something together. When I invest in you, there's an investment in me. This is one of the reasons that in our history, of of South African history, we didn't experience a violent revolution. It was because, one of the reasons, that the, uh, the, the, the movements involved in the fight against apartheid saw the perpetrators as people who needed to be freed from the prison that they had trapped themselves in. And Ubuntu was, we're not just gonna free ourselves. We need you to understand that what you are doing is not how you have been called to live. And Archbishop Tutu led that charge and he led it so well. The community of God at work That was the church bringing about change. Now, one of the things that comes into this is that if we talk about community, we need to understand kingdom. And again, we can go for hours talking about the kingdom, but I'm gonna just, I want you to understand the emphasis. When we speak of community, we're talking about a kingdom community, the kingdom of God. This is a central theme in Jesus' teaching. Mark chapter 1, 15, Jesus begins his ministry and he says, the time has been fulfilled The kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the good news. And then he goes out and he invites people from every background to come and be a part of the kingdom that God is establishing. Paul does the same thing. Paul also has a worldview. And he sees the preaching and the teaching of the gospel, the church, as being the vehicle through which we call the world to come and join what God has inaugurated in Christ. And in the kingdom, Paul says, we find new life. He actually calls us new creations. We find new values, where Paul teaches that we actually become people who value the things of heaven, not this world. And we find a new community, where Paul speaks about how we come together. And so to be followers of Christ, if you're a Christian, it's simply to be a kingdom person. We're called to be people of the kingdom and to have allegiance to that kingdom. Right, that's Ubuntu theology and the kingdom. Let's talk about community and reconciliation. For Paul we see, Paul by the way wrote most of the New Testament, and whenever we speak about how church should operate, it's Paul that we go to. We see that biblical community is reconciliation. What is reconciliation? Reconciliation is how we have entered the kingdom of God. Reconciliation is that God has made it possible and done all of the hard work for, for me, a sinner, right, somebody who shouldn't be here, to be made right with him. That is not just me going and saying, I'm sorry, God. It changes the whole way that I live and relate to him, and it changes how he relates to me. And there's this, this kind of give and take in the relationship. Reconciliation is all about relationship. And then, from Paul's point of view, once we've been reconciled to God, we live to reconcile with each other. 2 Corinthians 5.18, Paul calls it the ministry of reconciliation. That we carry this message and we are reconciling people to God through Christ. So reconciliation is community. The example that Paul gives us is a wonderful little book in your New Testament called Philemon. Can everybody say Philemon? It's not Philemon, okay, Philemon, okay? I am, I am uh, uh, something of a nerd, so those things are important to me, but um, I can say it, okay? Um, so Philemon, we'll call him Philemon. Now Philemon was a church leader, he was probably in a city called Colossia, right? The letter to Colossians was written to his church. And the church met in his home, and they probably included his whole household. So Philemon is a wealthy Roman, either by birth or by citizenship, And that means that he's got some status. He's somebody important. And as this Roman, he had in his household slaves 
because that was the status that he held. Now, we need to understand a little bit, and again, we can go into this, but we don't have time today. Roman society was built on slavery. And throughout the empire, this was a very common way to live. But we need to understand a couple of things because it's going to help us understand just how big the message of Paul is in this letter. Slaves were considered in Rome objects, not people. They were owned by other people, and they had no rights. Onesimus, who is the the kind of person that the letter focuses on, was a slave to Philemon. And at some point, Onesimus ran away from Philemon. And he headed out into the world and tried to get himself freedom. And at some point, he realized that he was probably going to be found and returned to Philemon. That's how Rome operated. And he thought to himself, better that I find somebody who can speak for me when I have to go back. Because Philemon knows Paul. And if I can get Paul's backing, I'll be protected. So Onesimus heads off to Ephesus where Paul is in prison. And some way or another, we don't know all the context, he gets himself to where Paul is and explains the story. Paul hands him a letter and Paul says, go back to Philemon and read him this letter. And we get the letter of Philemon. What does Paul get at in the letter? That's the context. Up on the screen, we'll see Philemon 7 to 9, and we're just going to look at a couple of verses um, as, we, as we get our sense around our community. Paul says this, I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love. This is to Philemon, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love, and I, Paul, do this as an old man and now also as a prisoner of Christ. In Paul's mind, Philemon knows that he is reconciled to God. What Paul is saying is, I'm not going to command you, although I could, to reconcile with your brother Onesimus. You're going to choose it. Because you know that reconciled people reconcile. That's what you know, Philemon. You know reconciled people reconcile. The biblical community that we see in this letter does not work because it's told to work. It works because the people who make it want to live a life of reconciliation. We choose it because we know what God has done for us. Paul goes on, Philemon from verse 10. We'll have it up on the screen. I am appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. His name actually means useful. Onesimus is useful. I am sending him, that is my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. And it goes on. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. We'll stop there. Paul looks at this relationship that previously was a relationship of great imbalance. And now he looks at it through the eyes of community and the church. And he says to Philemon, you have to understand, this man who once had no identity, no name, who wasn't even a person, is not only someone that I'm sending back to you as a Christian, he is my son in the faith. And in Christ, he has an identity, so you will accept him as your brother. You will welcome him back, and you will love him, and you're going to choose to do it. And we look at that, and we go, wow, Paul, that's amazing. Philemon, wow, and Onesimus, that's great news. But it's not just for the first century. This is for us. Because church is a place, the community of God is a place, not only where those who have no identity and who have no no sense of place can come and find it, but where we together outwork what it means to follow Jesus. We welcome each other, we love each other, we build with each other, we accept each other, we pray with each other. Community outworks because I know that through my reconciliation to God, To be reconciled to you is not just to go to you every time I do something wrong and say, I'm sorry. To be reconciled to you is to put myself aside and to say, you're as important 
as I think I am. Right? I'll be honest with you. I, th I think I'm pretty important sometimes. You know, <laughs> I think I'm pretty important sometimes. But I have to remind myself, no, that's not kingdom community. You are a person as valued and loved by God as I am. And so we see this response, uh, we see this reconciliation is community. And then we see reconciliation produces responsibility. And I'm going to end with this. We notice that Paul leaves Philemon to make the choice. Philemon, as a reconciled person of God, has the responsibility, which Paul reminds him of, but then Philemon has to choose to do it. And just like that, we all, all of us, are in a position, if we are followers of Christ, where we have a responsibility because we're reconciled to God, to step into that relationship with each other, to be a part and engage with the community. The message of Philemon is for us as much as it was for that church. Our individualistic culture can tell us that it is the church, whatever that means, who must program and create and engineer this thing called community. That's not how Paul sees the church. That's not, Paul sees the church as people. People coming together and living kingdom values. He says that it is every individual who is reconciled to God who then reconciles with brothers and sisters and live out that reconciliation who bring about the kingdom of heaven. That looks like people who have nothing else in common being present in each other's lives daily. It looks like the rich and the poor serving one another joyfully. It looks like the famous and the unknown making space to be known by each other. In other words, it looks like Acts chapter 2, where we're told in verse 44 that the believers met daily. They shared everything that they had with one another, and they built each other before they built themselves. You and I are a part of that same community, and today we need it more than ever. The world is not going to be a place in which people who have no identity, no knowledge of who God has made them to be, where they can find that. No political system, no ideology will bring people together in love like the kingdom of God does. This is the only place where I can truly say, I belong, not because of me, but because of him. You belong with me, and we're building this thing together. I want you to succeed. I want you to know more of Jesus. I want you to work out your gifts. I'm not threatened by you. In fact, when you get better, I get better. And that is kingdom at work. So the challenge for us is this. If you are somebody who's been a Christian for a long time, you're pursuing Acts chapter 2 church, keep on pursuing it. But we're going to find it in that kind of thinking and living. And if you are somebody who's brand new to the faith and you're going, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> Give it a try. Because this way of living is what changes the world. It brings hope, it brings life, it brings joy. And it only looks like the kingdom when I take responsibility to live this reconciled life with you. So that's really a brief summary of community. There's so much more that we can have a look at. But I hope that you will go from here, not just waiting to come back next week, but wanting to invest in the people that God has also reconciled because he has brought you for a purpose to this place. He's put you in this community to do something that only you can do. Turn to the person next to you and say, I love you. Right, well, be careful how you say it. I mean, let's just make sure it's like a God I love, right? college things, you know. <laughs> and why don't we pray together? Heavenly Father, thank you for the work that you have done to make us right with you. Thank you for giving us a community of kingdom people, a community of people through whom we can not only live our lives, but through whom we can flourish and prosper as we build this thing called church together. Thank you that you have redeemed us, that you have saved us, and help us to see 
the people that you've put around us through the same eyes that you see them. Help us to love as you have loved us. Help us to be kind as you are kind to us. Help us to forgive as you have forgiven us. And in doing so, may we see this world begin to transform through your church, your people, our family. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Why don't you, uh, we're going to go into time of worship and we're just going to respond. But before we do that, I'm going to ask you to stand up real quick. And uh, I'm just really aware that a message like this can be very much for, sound like it's for people that are already in. You know, it's like, oh no, well, I've got to be in the club now to really experience the club. And I just want to remind you that all of this begins with that idea of God reconciling himself with us. And that's a fancy way of saying that God simply comes near to us. He forgives us of our sins. He gives us an identity. He tells us who we are. And in Christianity, we call that being saved. And you might be feeling this pull where you're like, that's what I'm looking for. I, I've been created. I think that this is what is lacking in my life, to be part of a community that looks like that, that sounds like that, that cares like that, that loves like that. But I don't know how to do it. Can I just say to you that it starts at the cross? It starts with Jesus. The gospel message is simply that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but he has saved us. And we can respond to that salvation by confessing Jesus as Lord and submitting to him. So I'm just gonna take this moment, whether you're in the room or you're online, and just give you the opportunity to respond to that message. That no matter what your history is, no matter what your background is, Jesus loves you. He has come for you, but he's not gonna leave you alone. He wants to bring you into this family. So if that's you today, just lift up your hand, no one else is looking around. Nobody is watching and going, whoa, who's going to do it? But just lift up your hand and let that be a, an outward sign of what you're doing in your heart to say, Jesus, I want you to forgive me. I want to receive that forgiveness. And I want to be a new creation. I want to be a new person. I see that hand. Thank you. I want to be that new person. I want to build this kingdom. I want to trust in you. If you're online, you can just put something in the comments. That's amazing. Thank you. All right, thank you. Now, if you, if you raise your hand, then uh, we'd love to speak to you after the service. But before we do that, we're going to pray. And the way that we confess faith in Jesus is through prayer. And so if you put your hand up or if you kind of went, I'm not too sure that I need to put my hand up or if I want to, you can just pray this where you are. God hears us. But as a church, we're going to pray together. And you can just follow along with me. You can just say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for making me right with God. I believe in you. I love you. I want to live for you. Come into my heart and be my Lord. In your name, amen. Amen. Hey, why don't we give a hand to those who prayed that. And honestly, if you did pray that, please, 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 we want to connect with you. We want to get you into this family. There's a connection point outside, and you can head on over there. We'd love to give you something that can help you start that process. There's so many things to plug into. But let's remember, church, to live as the people of God, loving each other, building each other. And let's go into this week with that. And to reconcile the lost To redeem the whole creation He did not despise the cross For He came your side He sought to the other side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake
Amen. Amen. Can we give it up to, for Matt for that amazing message? So inspiring, challenging, and encouraging all at the same time. Let's grab a seat. We're nearly finished service for just a couple of things. We're going to finish, uh, we're going to receive our offering together, which is something we do every week. And this is a great opportunity for us to put into practice that collective responsibility we just heard about. We are a family together. And uh, look, at we can do so much because of what you do through your giving church and what we do together as a family. We are still continuing to feed people. You know, we did the, the feeding program over Christmas. We're still continuing every week, week in, week out, to work with the refugee charities in our city, to work with the local school in our city, to work with other shelters and, and uh, accommodation for people that really need it. Still doing that all across our city. And we're able to do that because of your continued giving and all the other things we're able to do so there's uh, different ways to give on the screen there is an envelope on your seat if you want to give by card you can put your details on there and fill it out that way so I'll give you a minute just to prepare your giving and uh, the team will have the containers that are going to come past and we'll do that together thank you church for your continued commitment to your giving uh, it's amazing you're an amazing church okay two final things to let you know about the first one is this, this Wednesday, everybody say this Wednesday, this Wednesday we have a soul night, really want to encourage you, you know I said this last week and we've put it on social media but it's going to be a really, we believe a really significant meeting together, I don't say that lightly, we really believe that this Wednesday we want to share some news and some updates with you as a church family as we get together that are significant for our journey as a church together. So please, if you can prioritize to be there, get sitters if you can, if you need babysitters, do whatever it, it takes to, to try and be here on Wednesday. We don't say that lightly. We know it's an extra commitment during the week, but really believe it's going to be an important time together for us as a church family. Have we got that? Brilliant. And then the, the second thing is this. Uh, growth Track is starting after this service on week one. If you don't know what Growth Track is, Growth Track is the best way in this church to get connected in. 
It's the best way to find your fit in this church family that Matt has just spoken about. Maybe you are new. Maybe you've been coming for months. Maybe you joined online and now you're joining us in person. Growth Track is the best way for you to come and meet some people, meet people in our teams, find out about the church, how to get connected, and who we are as a family. That is going to start straight after the service upstairs uh, through there. Brilliant. That's it. What a great day we've had. All the families of the the kids that are getting dedicated. You've got tables out there. Got a feeling deep inside my soul Nothing in this world comes close I was driving, I'll give you control This is love, great love Grace came through Found me broken, made me new
in hell. 